and we can get going on with slide number four. Um, and actually you can do your intro with slide three about PCG's role in the process. Perfect. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brittany Trujillo uh, with Public Consulting Group, who is working with California Department of Aging. We are a public sector consulting firm that works with health education, human service agencies, primarily public sector. Um, we have contracted with California Department of Aging or CDA to provide these fiscal intermediary services for the Bridge to Recovery Grant Program. So we are helping design the overall grant program, evaluate applications, disperse award funds, manage reporting as well. We'll also be providing technical assistance to applicants throughout the application, award, and the payment process. So you'll be seeing, I think, and hearing a lot from us over the next couple of years. Thank you, Brittany. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Chantel Bush, and I am the Health at Home Branch Chief with the California Department of Aging, and I oversee our home and community-based services program. Thank you for joining us today, and the purpose of today's webinar is to provide an overview of the request for application for the Bridge to Recovery for Adult Day Services COVID-19 Mitigation and Resilience Grant Program. We're also going to be providing an overview of the Grants Connect portal that applications are being completed and submitted through for this funding. Right, next slide, please. Just to give you a little bit more background, as we specified in the earlier webinar on May 9th, um, this grant is for $55.85 million, and it is a, was approved in the 2022-23 governor's budget. This grant funding is intended for the purposes of preventing infectious outbreaks in in-center congregate settings, preparing for public health emergencies, and to improve workforce recruitment and retention in programs such as the Community-Based Adult Services Program, or CBAS, and the Program of All-Inclusive Care, All Care for the Elderly, the PAGES Program, as well as in center settings as adult day healthcare setting, settings and adult day programs, with the intent to improve the health, health safety, and well-being of vulnerable, at-risk older adults and people with disabilities through safe access to in-center congregate services. This grant will be a competitive process for funds to be awarded to the aforementioned sites and centers. Our hope and intent for this funding is that it will be used to meet the purpose and the current needs of centers as previously mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, additionally, I'm sorry, can you go back one, please? Um, I wanted to also specify that this $55.84 million um, has been broken down into an eligible amount based upon the submission of interest that was provided through the letter of intent process. So as a result of those previous submissions, um, it was determined that the allowable uh, funding that a provider can request per site is $100,619 in one-time funding to address the previous uh, mentioned um, requirements of in infection prevention and to also just workforce sh workforce shortages. Um, again, this funding can be spent on allowable expenses, and we will go through those a little further in this presentation. Next slide. As a reminder, there are still some important dates and deadlines to remember. Uh, the letter of intent period has closed. It closed on May 15th at 5 p.m. And we opened the application to start receiving applications for grant funding on May 16th. Um, today is this webinar where we are providing technical assistance. And we have a deadline for you to submit any written questions to us by May 31st at 5 p.m. Based upon the submission of questions that we have received thus far, we will be providing an addendum to the request for application that's been posted to the CDA webpage. The deadline for submission of those questions and answers is June 7th, 2023. And then also, more importantly, the deadline to submit your applications through Grants Connect is July 17th, 2023 by 11.59 p.m. We anticipate that we will be providing award notifications and sending those out in early fall in October 2023. And all funds that have been awarded must be extended by March 31, 2026. 
Next slide. In order to be eligible for this funding, all of the applicants must have completed and submitted a letter of intent by the 5 p.m. deadline on May 15th, which has closed. All of the completed applications that were submitted for site, um, we identified them. And as I mentioned, we included those in the count to evenly disperse the allowable amount of funding that a uh, center site location can request. In addition, the um, applicant centers must be licensed and in good standing with their um, relevant boards. Next slide. In regards to the funding parameters, grantees will receive funding on a reimbursement basis. So in other words, um, grantees will who are awarded funding will submit invoices that will be reviewed and compared to ensure that they meet the eligible allowable expenses for the project costs. And in order to get re reimbursement, we must receive an approved invoice and any supporting documentation to justify the expenses. So that could include a receipt, a payroll re report, a contract, et cetera. Grantees will be able to submit invoices throughout the program period according to their project plan and timeline. So as previously mentioned and mentioned here again, final invoices must be submitted by March 31st, 2026. That allows us to do all of our closeout activities. Failure to submit timely invoices could result in the loss of payments to the grantee. So it's imperative that you all adhere to these required timeframes. Next slide. Eligible activities include providers' ability to spend funds on facilities and staffing improvements necessary to provide incident concrete services. Some of the most common things are air filtration, um, center enhancements to allow uh, more usable space to be provided, whether that be outdoor space or in center. Um, and then we also are allowing um, additional funding to be used for modifying usable space such as mentioned repurposing the outdoor areas and expanding usable program space, also for sanitation and infection control and vehicle modifications or preservation. And that includes making sure there's maintenance on vehicles, installing surveillance equipment to make sure your vehicles are safe and secure, and also telehealth. So as the project um, moves forward and applicants begin to um, want to invest these funds, they will be required to provide invoices and additional documentation to support that the facility improvements align with the requirements of this grant funding. Next slide. In addition, staff enhancements is also going to be eligible for use with this funding. In other words, staff, uh, centers can utilize this funding to help stabilize their workforce to hire temporary staff, um, and also just to make sure that they're compliant with the mandated and regulatory staffing ratios. Um, this includes, but is not limited to the following projects. So that includes staff recruitment and retention, whatever those costs may be for posting jobs, and also being able to retain staff through sign on and or retention bonuses. The allowability to hire temporary workers is also included with this funding, and that includes salaries for temporary workers when there is a vacancy or absence in key required positions. Um, what we've heard from our stakeholders throughout this duration is that they feel that there is a really great need to really retain and hire nurses and social workers, therapists, transportation drivers, because that has been the market that has been the most competitive for them, where they have lost these particular staff workers um, in order to um, have prevented them from being able to serve their participants in center. Um, wage differentials are also allowable, and that's for providing raises to direct support staff to ensure that there's equity amongst similar roles and skill sets. Um, final wages from salary increases should comport with or be comparable to the local labor laws, standards, and prevailing wages in your particular service area. I wanted to also reiterate here, I know the question has come up as to the allowability for certain positions or executive positions to be um, have this funding extended. And it is CDA's position after giving this some thought and consideration that the only allowability for executives to uh, get enhancements with their salaries would be through a bonus of sorts, a retention bonus. 
Um, other and there are the parameters of that is specified within the request for application. There is a cap and a minimum that must be adhered to in order for this to be considered um, in the review during your application submission. And um, we'll be happy to address more questions around this towards the end. Um, but we are not allowing for wage differentials to be provided to um, executive positions. But we have made the allowability that in certain circumstances that perhaps a bonus within the confines as defined within the RFA would be allowable. And then the last thing that we are allowing the staffing enhancement funding to go towards are for staff trainings, and that's to provide training on infection prevention and control and for health and safety measures. Next slide, please. We do also have listed here ineligible expenses, such as purchasing or leasing vehicles. We recognize that the funding amounts for this, um, we just felt that it would probably benefit centers to utilize the, the, the funding to really maintain vehicles rather than purchasing. Um, also ineligible expenses include purchasing furniture, purchasing appliances, purchasing of laptops, tablets, cell phones, or any mobile device increasing wages for executive leadership staff, which I previously mentioned, uh, where we have made an allowability in, um, to allow for bonuses in particular circumstances, one-time bonuses. Um, and then also, um, it's another ineligible expense is installing broadband internet service or mobile hotspots, uh, paying for monthly broadband or internet fees, building purchasing telehealth applications or platforms, um, paying monthly telehealth application platform fees, and also training staff or participants to use telehealth application platforms. I want to just reiterate here that we are being very um, particular about what our ineligible expenses are. Um, upon submission of applications, if there's any technical assistance that needs to be provided to ensure that your ask falls within the guidelines of what is eligible, we will have staff on hand to be able to provide that clarification. Next slide, please. Lastly, um, for questions about the grant, you can still submit your questions to the Bridge to Recovery grant, and they must again be submitted by the deadline of May 31st, 2023 by 5 p.m. Pacific time. And you can email questions to CDA underscore Bridge to Recovery at PCGUS.com. We will not be answering questions individually. All questions that are submitted will become part of their addendum and they will be publicly posted so that all can be aware of what questions were asked and the answers that were provided. Questions will also be posted on the grants webpage on June 7, 2023 um, at the grant opportunities page that is on the CDA website. Next question or next slide, please. Lastly, um, grant assistance can be provided. So if you have any questions on the Bridge Recovery grant application process, qualifications, or guidelines, you can submit those questions either um, via email, by visiting the program webpage, or by calling 866-535-8669. And I will turn it over at this point to Peter, who will provide additional information on how to submit your application through the Grants Connect portal. Thank you, Sean. So, and thank you everyone again for joining us. I'm Peter Busby. I'm a communications manager here with PCG. So we're now going to go over some sort of guidelines and steps for submitting the Bridge to Recovery application through Grants Connect. So just to start off, just in case you run into any problems down the line, you can access support on Grants Connect in two ways. First, there are support links at the bottom right of the sign-in page. You can see that in that top screenshot. After you sign in, you can also click the question mark icon next to your name in the top right corner of the screen. Now, this is the screen after you sign in when you're starting a new application. Most of you should have already, well, all of you should have already submitted an LOI, so you should already have a Grants Connect account. If you need to log in for additional users down the line, we have instructions for that in our first webinar and in our Grants Connect guide on the Bridge to Recovery webpage. So we won't review that now because presumably most of you already have accounts. But again, if you need help with that, please do check that first webinar 
or review the help content on the Bridge to Recovery page. But when you first log in, you should see this welcome screen with an option to start a new application. If you do not see this welcome screen or have trouble accessing the application, please try the following. First, clear your browser cache just to get rid of any cookies or browsing history, things like that. Next, you can try to access the grant in a different browser. So if you're using Chrome, try it in Edge, Firefox, something along those lines. Or if you're still having trouble, please do reach out to our technical assistance team. Chantel just gave you the contact info on a previous slide. We'll give it to you again later on. But that's an easy way to get help if you need it. I know some of you are submitting multiple applications on behalf of multiple sites. If that's the case, please return to the grant link on this slide or on the grant web page each time you start a new application for a new site. That will help ensure each application gets submitted correctly. So now we'll take a look at the sections of the application, starting with applicant questions and project description. So applicant questions covers basic information about your organization. That includes things like your mission statement, your current programs, and the average number of participants you serve. In this section, you'll also have a chance to update information from your letter of intent. We'll talk about that in a second. In project description, you'll provide a general overview of your project, including the needs it addresses, key milestones and deliverables, key personnel, potential barriers and your strategy for overcoming them and your sustainability plan and timeline. You'll also enter your project objectives and work plan as part of this section. The next section are your budget requests. For each budget category you select, you'll enter costs along with descriptions and justifications for each of these costs. You only need to complete budget sections that are relevant to your particular project. So you'll select the categories that are relevant to you. And at that point, the related sections of your application will appear. So there are some additional guidelines that apply to indirect costs specifically as a budget request. So indirect costs are any costs that you incur for common or joint objectives that cannot be readily identified with a certain project activity. So that generally includes things like facility and maintenance costs, depreciation on your building or any admin expenses. When entering your expenses, indirect costs cannot exceed 10% of the total combined cost of your other budget categories. So continuing with application section, the final two are attachments and attestations. In the attachment section, you can upload any required attachments or any documents that bolster your application. So that can include things like cost estimates, more detailed budgets or leases or titles for buildings you plan to modify. You'll also include a list of all the documents you attach and your reason for including them with your application. On the attestations page, you'll agree to any and all conditions you're required to follow as a condition of receiving a grant award. You need to agree to all of them before you'll be able to submit your application. Your application will auto save as you complete it. So you can just check that save icon in the bottom left to confirm that it is auto saving. Don't need to worry about it yourself. If you leave that auto saved information will be available when you return to complete the application. You can navigate through the major sections of the application that we just discussed using the tabs on the top line navigation bar of Grants Connect. Depending on the size of your browser window, some of those tabs might be cut off. Just click more over there to the right and you should be able to see the rest of the tabs. You can also download a copy of the complete application using the download button at the top right of the application. But please do remember if you download your application, you still must submit it through Grants Connect. You cannot download an application, fill it out and then email it to anybody, submit it that way. It has to go through Grants Connect. So please do remember that. Peter, can I add one piece there? Yeah, absolutely. The downloaded version, if you do that, does look vastly different from what you'll see in the system. The way the way it's laid out, it makes it look like an extremely long application. Um, and it's a little more complicated to read. So just want to prepare anyone who may want to download it to review it. It, it looks a little different um, and maybe a little overwhelming. So just be prepared for that. Thank you. Appreciate that note, Brittany. I'm sure our, our applicants do as well. So uh, we talked 
a little bit about the application sections question. Two things we want to review for that. So first, the application questions section includes space to enter the application ID from your letter of intent. This is one among many ways we'll use to match your application to your LOI. So you can find the application ID for your LOI in the confirmation email you received when you submit it. You can see here it's boxed over there on the right. You should have received such a confirmation email when you originally sent your LOI. You can also find it under my applications that tab we will review that on a later slide. If you use the same login credentials that you used when submitting your LOI. So if you use the same username, same password, you can find it in that my applications tab or as I said, you can find it in your confirmation email here as well. So I know we've already seen some people asking questions about updating information from your LOI. As I said earlier, the applications question section gives you the chance to update any information from your LOI that might have changed since you submitted. You can see the relevant questions here outlined in red. Again, you just select yes, and then you enter the list of changes you need to make for that particular letter of intent. So in general, each section includes some of, if not all of the following question types. There are fill in the blanks, multiple choice, drop down, short answer, and table entry. If you've ever filled out an online form before, most of these should be fairly familiar to you. So I'm just going to go over short answer and table entry because the interfaces on Grants Connect might be slightly different than you've seen on some other areas. So short answer questions include a maximum word count, your current word count, and controls for resizing the answer window. So you can see them all listed here. If you do want to resize that window to see your entire answer, you just need to click and drag on the window control in the bottom right corner of that entry window. So budget tables in our application use their own sort of slightly different interface. The number of entries in your budget table is determined by the number you enter at that first question in the top. So you can see here, it just asks how many supply entries you need. We added two as an example. You can see those two rows added here. You'll then enter the cost per unit, number of units, in this case at least, and the funds requested for each entry. The total cost field on each of your budget tables will auto populate based on the costs you enter under that funds requested tab. So that takes care of, you know, at least the grant specific entry fields. Once you've filled everything out, you feel like you're ready to go, you can click sign and submit at the bottom of the attestations page to submit your application. This will take you to a signature page where you can type, upload, or draw your signature, whichever you prefer. Once you've signed your application, you are free to submit it. Once you submit it, you should receive a confirmation email just letting you know that everything's gone through. Now, if there are any errors in your application when you try to submit it, things like missing fields, skipping questions, missing sections, a red exclamation mark will appear beside the section tab where there are any errors. You can see it in the screenshot on the right. When you navigate to that particular section, you'll also see a list of errors at the top. Just correct any errors, resubmit your application, and then hopefully this time it goes through. If not, just do it again and make sure you take care of any that might be left. So this is the My Applications tab that I mentioned earlier. You can view all your applications, whether you submitted them already or are still working on them, in that My Applications tab. You can just see that link to it at the top of the Grants Connect screen. All you need to do is click that My Applications, or conversely, you can click View All My Applications on the Welcome screen when you first log in. From the My Applications screen, you can edit any some unsubmitted applications. You can view the status of submitted applications or complete any revisions that the review team might have requested. We'll go over revisions later on in the presentation. As I said earlier, you can also find the application ID for any of your applications or for your original letter of intent. If you logged in using the same username you did for that LOI, again, you need to be using the same credentials if you want to find your application ID in the My Applications page. Just be sure if you are looking for your LOI entry that you're not looking at the application ID for your application. They will both be listed here 
in chronological order. So make sure if you're looking for your letter of intent, you find that entry, not your application. You can also see the statuses of any of your applications in the My Applications page. You can just see them boxed here in red, listed at the top and next to an individual application. There are six main statuses you might see. There's draft, your application has been saved, but you have not submitted it yet. There's a waiting review. You've submitted your application, but it has not yet been reviewed by one of our grant administrators. It's in progress. Our grant administrators are currently working on a review. There's on hold. A reviewer has requested a revision. Again, we'll go over that process in a second. There's approved. The application has been approved or declined. Your application has been denied. So when you check in your statuses, those should basically walk you through the entire grant review process step by step. So now that we've gotten to the grant review process, I will turn things back over to Brittany, who will review the scoring categories and criteria, sort of how you can expect this to be scored. Great, right, thanks, Peter. So um, just a reminder, applicants must have submitted a letter of intent for your application to be reviewed and scored. So if a letter of intent was not submitted and identifying the number of sites that you intended to apply for, whether it was one or five or 10 or whatever that might be, if there aren't, uh, if there isn't a concurrent letter of intent, then your application will not be reviewed or scored any further. Only those applications that have a corresponding letter of intent will be reviewed and scored. It, once that has been determined, reviewers will score the applications in three main categories. One is minimum eligibility is going to be scored as a pass or fail, so you either meet those requirements or you do not. The project description and narrative will be scored on a scale of zero to four points. And the budget and cost proposal will be scored on a scale of zero to four points. There are a maximum of 44 points available for the project description and budget narrative sections combined. No item or any single question holds more or less weight than any other. Next slide, please. So here are the scoring guidelines that our reviewers will be using. Zero points is an interpretation of ineligible which is meaning that none of the elements are addressed for whatever that item is. None of the documents or required information is present. A one is that it's insufficient, that maybe some elements are not addressed. Those that are don't contain the necessary detail. Some documentation and required information might be missing or is deficient. Um, these weaknesses may have may likely have a you know, significant effect on the project. A score of two means minimal. The elements are addressed, although some don't contain necessary detail and or support. Most of the documentation and required information is present and acceptable. The weaknesses will likely have moderate effect on the project. Three is satisfactory, that elements are clearly addressed with necessary detail and adequate support. Most documentation and required information is specific and sufficient. Weaknesses will likely have minor effect on the project. And a score of four is excellent, that all the elements are clearly addressed. They're well conceived, thoroughly developed, and well supported. The documentation and required information are specific and comprehensive, and any identified weaknesses will likely not have an effect on the project. Scoring levels and funding. So again, we're scoring at, on zero to 44 points. So high ranking is a score of 31 to 44 points, meaning high scoring applications will be promoted to the next step of the review process, recommended to CDA for full funding. A moderate score is 12 to 30 points. These applications will be also promoted to the next step of the review process and recommended maybe for partial funding. And a score of low is zero to 11 points. Um, those applications will be denied or not recommended for funding to CDA. So let's look at the minimum eligibility item to review. Or the reviewers will be looking at, is the facility that you're applying for an eligible licensed facility? Do they have a license in good standing? That will be checked upon reviewing of the application. And it's again, a pass or fail. 
The next pass or fail item is, did you identify one of the following categories? Are you submitting your application for the infection prevention and mitigation, such as air filtration or ventilation needs? Or did you submit it for workforce shortages or wage differentials, broader needs related to infection control, access to care? So your telehealth, staffing and retention, equipment, staff training, vehicle modifications. Next slide, please. Then our reviewers are looking at these following items within your application. Did you provide the overall project description and, and scoring that on a zero through four? They're scoring what issue or need is the project addressing? How does the project lever leverage the structure currently in place to provide services? Who are the key personnel that would be involved and what will their, what will their role be in this project? including their name, title, and description of their role. What preparation have you done, if any, to date? What are the potential barriers to success and alternative plans to ensure project success? Have you received other grants or funds to support the goals of the Bridge to Recovery Grant Program? And if yes, who provided those and for what purpose? And are you using Bridge to Recovery funds to supplement those other funds? And then we're also just looking to see if you made any changes to the letter of intent. It is not scored, but something we're reviewing. And then we're asking if you did what you what you changed. For the budget and cost narrative, again, we are scoring on a scale of zero to four, looking at the reasonable, reasonable reasonableness of the funding amount. So is what you're asking for, is that reasonable? Um, if the cost that you're asking for is that reasonable based off of your project description and intended use of the funds. We're also looking at the reasonableness of the project timeline. How will the project be sustained once the grant dollars have been exhausted? What is your plan for that? And does your project budget align with the activities in your project description and narrative, including the objectives and the work plan? Again, those are all scored on a zero through four for a total of 16 points there. Responding to requests for revisions. So as our reviewers are looking at your application, they may reach out to you and ask for some revisions to your application to ensure that the information in your application matches the letter of intent or what Department of Aging has on file to ensure that you agree to the attestations, also giving you an opportunity to clarify any points of issue. So any areas that we have questions or concerns with, we want to reach out to you and give you the opportunity to address those or clarify that information. When we do this, your application status will show as on hold. And you'll also receive an audit automated email that's advising you of the requested revision. So you will automatically get that email through the Grants Connect platform if we're asking for additional information from you. Responding to those requests. So once you get that email, or if you get that email from the My Applications page, once you've logged into Grants Connect, you'll wanna select Revise Form at the top to make any necessary revisions and resubmit. So our team, again, will, if there are revisions necessary, we'll email you through Grants Connect identifying the areas for clarification or revision so that when you select revised form, you can go to those areas. Make sure that you click submit after that. However, you do have to resubmit once you do your revisions. For grant assistance, we have a team ready and able and prepared to help you all. So if you have questions on the grant, please go to the actual program webpage through the California Department of Aging. That is in the chat and we'll make sure it gets added again. There's also a toll free number that you can call to reach our technical assistance team 866-535-8669. And our email again is CDA underscore bridge to recovery at PCGUS.com. Please don't hesitate to reach out to our team for support. Next slide, please. And we are now to the questions section or portion. I know that there have been a lot coming in through the chat. I know 
I've been responding to some as possible. So has Jennifer, but we can go ahead and go start at the beginning of questions and go through those if that works for you, Chantel and CDA team. Um, yes, Brittany, but before we get started with questions, I did want to clarify a couple of things previously covered. So for the first thing, I wanted to specify that we do have a Grants Connect guide on the CDA webpage. It's a guide to using Grants Connect. And I know Peter did a really great job at covering a lot of those screens, but I just wanted to assure you all that CDA has posted a, um, a resource in our helpful resources on the Grants Opportunities webpage for Bridge to Recovery. That will take you to the uh, guide, guide to using Grants Connect. I just wanted to promote that, that that um, is also out there. Um, and then before we, we do start with questions, I did want to go back to slide number 13 and provide some clarification around something I previously said. Okay. So in eligible expenses, um, I wanted to address that everything on this page is still accurate. These are still considered ineligible expenses. The exception to increasing wages for executive leadership and staff, that is still an ineligible expense. The one area that we will clarify in an addendum to our RFA is providing bonuses for executive leadership and staff. But I wanted to clarify that that is not applicable to all executive leadership and staff. We are only making the exception for program director. So we will allow there, if that is the need for your funding to where you would like to use um, any awarded funding to provide a bonus to your program director, we will make that allowability, but it will have to be done within the confines of the requirements in the request for application, which we do specify in the application and can be up to a particular dollar amount. So I just wanted to provide that clarification that program directors is the only exception and it still must be provided within the confines of the requirements outlined and specified in the request for application up to that specific dollar amount. Given that, I'm, oh, I'm ready to go ahead and open it up for questions. Perfect, thanks Chantel. Um, in the letter of intent, we stated that we had two facilities or sites before clarification was issued about this. We were told that we could correct this in the application. How do we do that? Um, Ming, we did go through that in the webinar. When you are in your application, there is one or two questions that ask if you need to make changes to your letter of intent and what changes you need to make or what was made. So um, once you start your application, you can put that information in there. Can someone explain the letter of intent, trying to ensure I didn't miss the deadline or the right process? Do you want me to take that, Chantel, or do you want to? I can take that, Brittany, thank you. The letter of intent was a process that CDA and PCG agreed upon in consultation with our sponsor and stakeholders. The intent of that process was for us to be able to do an equal disbursement of funding across sites that express interest and so we opened up a letter of intent period for two weeks from May 1st to May 15th, which closed at 5 p.m. Those that were interested in this funding opportunity were, to, were required to complete a letter of intent in the Grants Connect portal at the close of that period, which was 5 p.m. on May 15th. We took the eligible amount of letter of intent that we received and we did an equal split uh, within the 55.4 million to determine what that amount would be up to awarded per site. Um, if you did not have an opportunity to submit a letter of intent, you are not eligible to compete for the grant funding. There was not an extension provided, nor will there be. We are now at the phase of accepting applications, um, which opens on May 16th and will close on July 17th. Are there any other clarifications anybody on PCG or CDA would like to provide to that? I, th I think one piece that goes with that question in general, Chantel, a lot of people have asked if they've submitted the letter of intent and identified whatever number of sites they did, can they edit that, let's say they submitted it for two sites, but wanna add another site 
therefore three applications. Can they do that? At this point in time, the period for that has closed, so that will not be allowable either. We use that final amount of uh, sites that were entered. If you completed one LOI and you identified multiple sites, we took that number and also used that towards our even distribution of splitting that funding to come out with the uh, total dollar amount that one can ask for per site. Thank you. Well, can funds be spent on a facility that won't open until the end of the year? No, You're, you, if you've submitted a letter of intent, it's, in, it's expected that that center was licensed and an eligible site in good standing. It's not intended for anything that's potentially going to open, which we will be able to validate at the time of application, whether when the license was submitted. Great. Or issued, should I say? Um, I think we've answered this, but will the slides be posted in the chat? The slides will be posted to the CDA webpage, along with a recording of this webinar and a transcription. Okay. Going through. There was a technical assistance question following submission of the letter of intent. The My Applications page auto-populated a specific request amount of 25000 which is less than the stated. Um, does this mean we can only apply for the twenty five? dollars No. If, that's, if you do have that issue, please reach out to our technical assistance team so we can look at that and um, make sure that everything is okay on that application. And that's at the CDA underscore bridge to recovery at pcgus.com. Is it $100,619 per licensed location or per whole agency? To answer that question, it's per licensed location as long as you specified that that site is included in your account. There are a lot of questions around the, the licensing and the numbers piece, Chantel, so I think we'll go through and um, some of them you'll, I think you'll just get answered as we can start answering them. But if a facility has two licensed programs operating out of it, can we apply for both licensed programs even if we said one facility? The answer to that is no. The, this funding is being issued per site, not, at, not based upon the number of lines of business being operated out of a particular location or site. It is per site not for lines of business at the site. Is there any provision for funding the staff required to manage the project? The budget exhibits suggest expenses that aren't listed as part of the approved uses. That's something we may have to discuss further. Um, and I don't know, if you, Brittany, if you all want to tackle that from the stance of the cost associated with um, running the project. Now, if there's any clarification around that in the budget. Um, there are some pieces in the application with some directions for each of the budget sections um, and what kind of information you input. And I'm just looking at the question again. Is there any provision for funding the staff required to manage the project? The budget exhibits suggest expenses that aren't listed for the approved uses. I think um, maybe I can speak generally, and we can also we'll take this one back with CDA as well. But you're asking for funds to put an air filtration system in. Let's say there is. Um, or let's say to hire some temporary staff, that might be an easier one. There are allowable costs associated with that for, I believe, um, Chantal and CDA team for the, the staff within your program who have to do the recruitment work. Yeah, I want to clarify on that too, Brittany. The funding is intended, and we can go back to, um, I believe it's uh, slide 12. as far Peter. as what the funding is used for, uh, for staffing enhancements, I believe it's, um, well, yes. There we go. Okay, 
So the funding really is intended to be used for these purposes only. Um, not to have staff funding the project. I think I'm a little concerned as to what do you mean by the provision of, of for funding the staff required to manage the project. I'm not sure what that would be, who that would be. Is that a temporary worker that is required as part of the operations of your center? Um, because the funding is not intended for that purpose. It's intended to really go towards um, keeping center operations going, air filtration, staff enhancements, et cetera. So off the cuff, I would say that there is no allowability for this provision as it's stated here, unless you provide additional clarification around this app. My immediate thought would be no. Thank you. When we log into the grant portal, it shows that the letter of intents are awaiting review, but we don't see any link to take us to the actual application. Are the applications not open until you've had a chance to review them or might there be some other issue? There have been a lot of questions about that. You have to please make sure you're using the actual application that is on the, the link for the application that was in the email sent last Tuesday afternoon to release to open the grant applications or on the CDA web page. You have to use that email. Um, you cannot use the original one that you use for your letter of intent. They are separate links. Make sure that you've cleared your browser cache, your cookies, your history as well. Uh, Grants Connect likes to take you back to maybe the letter of intent. So please make sure you've done those things. If that still doesn't work, please email our team and we have other ways to get the application to you. But please make sure you've tried those options. Can funds be used for tuition reimbursement for staff? No, that is not an allowable cost, although it's not specifically stated as an, an eligible cost. Um, our hope is that the centers would use this funding for infrastructure improvements, um, also for maintaining their workforce in order to serve their participants. Um, so anything outside of that, we are not making that an eligible cost. And, it, and we have provided those parameters and guidelines within the request for application, and we've also gone over them today um, in a few of those slides. We've added addressed. Are we able to submit to add a site to the letter of intent we submitted? That's been addressed as well. What aspect of telehealth does qualify to be funded? Is it only the staff doing the telehealth? Um, if you can go back to that slide too, Peter, I think it also may be on slide 12. Maybe before that one. Yeah, I think maybe. Don't telehealth, improving participant access to telehealth services. I know we provided a lot of guidelines and, and um, parameters around telehealth about what's ineligible and what's disallowed. Um, in this aspect, we would say it would be applicable to staff providing the telehealth. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that you consider that um, as to whether that also ties into um, staff enhancements as far as their wages. So to answer your question, could it be used for the staff providing the telehealth? It can if it's um, perhaps if they're a temporary worker that you've hired in order to operate within that function. There was a question. Um, we are answering questions in the webinar. Uh, again, about the, the application. So we've covered that as well. There was a, a comment, Chantel. I think you need to define the site. Site is location. Just to be clear, it's that particular individual location. Please explain the budget narrative template examples, specifically the examples of graduate student researcher and project manager. These are a bit confusing relative to the limited categories for which we, we can request funding of personnel, wage differentials or staff retention bonuses, for example. Brittany, can you repeat that? I'm trying to follow you, but I was I missed part of what yep. you said. Please explain the budget narrative template examples 
specifically the examples of graduate student researcher and project manager. These are a bit confusing relative to the limited categories for which we can request funding of personnel, such as wage differentials or staff retention bonuses. Is there someone who would like to take that budget template question? I think um, I know that we had worked with your team on those, Chantal, and I'm wondering if we can provide some ad additional examples in the addendum that, that we'll post with the questions to help clarify that for people. Okay, we can certainly do that and take that back. Thank you. Okay, we've answered those. If answered. we submit a question, will we get a response or will our questions be held to be answered after May 31st? We are compiling all questions that are submitted to be part of the RFA addendum. So they will be responsible will be provided after May 31st, which still does give you time, you know, to hopefully incorporate the response to that into the final, you know, completion of your application. We submitted a lot of intent, but it says awaiting review. Should we have received approval or rejection? No, we are, you will not receive anything about your letter of intent. Um, that was used to identify, as Chantal said, the, the maximum amount of funding per application and to connect those together, but you will not receive anything specific to your letter of intent. Next is I have an ADHC building, a PACE building, and a shared facility in another city. Is this three sites? From that description, I would say it sounds like that is three separate sites, yes. One provider with two different locations under one entity with same TIN number, but each center has its own NPI number. That too would be considered two different sites. We have two ADHC sites under Dignity Health. We submitted the letter of intent for one site, but would like to add the other location. They are separate NPIs. If you didn't make the cutoff to do that during the LOI period, unfortunately, we're not able to open that up for you to do that at this juncture. Can funding be used for existing projects that are currently in progress, initiated before application submission? No, they cannot. We are not allowing any of the funding to go towards any prior projects. These items uh, in funding will only be done on a reimbursement basis after we receive invoices and have reviewed and approved them. If an application is denied, is there a way to alter and resubmit? There is no appeal process to alter and resubmit. There is a technical assistance process throughout the application period, which we hope will be beneficial to you all before you make your final submission. How can we access the replay of this webinar? This will be posted on the CDA webpage, um, along with the, the slide deck and the transcription from today's webinar. How do we update our letter of intent to reflect that we have multiple sites instead of one? Unfortunately, I, I, that period. Oh, go ahead, Brittany. No, I, I think there were some other questions going with that. So go ahead, Chantel. <laughs> Unfortunately, the letter of intent process has closed. Um, CDA and PCG did send out clarification prior to the letter of intent period closing to clarify how entities could update their site equals location numbers. So unfortunately, um, and there was an opportunity for that to be done prior to the close on May 15th, 2023. Unfortunately, if you were not able to do that during that time frame, then there was not going to be another opportunity for you to update that information. Won't the application clearly submit when completed, i.e., what do you mean about not using the same link as a letter of intent? Won't that be clear? Um, to submit your actual to even go to the application, you have to use the application link, not the link that you used to submit your letter of intent. You will also have to make sure you click submit once you are completed with your application. 
So again, to start your application, use the link that was sent out last Tuesday that's on the CDA webpage as well. That's in the chat. Once you've done your account, if you haven't already, you will start a new application. And then you do have to click submit once you are complete with your application. Will you include these questions in those answered in writing after May 31st? That would be helpful. Yes. There are multiple reasons we're doing the transcription and recording so that we can make sure we have documentation of all of these. I submitted the letter of intent at the same link that you said should only be for the application, not the letter of intent. Does that mean our application is screwed now? Go ahead, please, uh, Michael, and send us an email so that we can provide some technical assistance to support you with that so that you can still get an application in. There's plenty of time still to do that, but please email us and we can provide that technical assistance. We were told that if we submitted a letter of intent with multiple sites before we were told to submit a letter of intent for each site that we could make changes later. In the box that was mentioned in the application where we can include letter of intent changes, would we put this issue there? Would this result in splitting our letter of intent into multiple letters of intent? Would we need to then to submit an application for each letter? If we submitted, an if we submitted a letter of intent stating we have two sites, is it possible to change that to three sites now? A lot of questions in there. Um, so I'm gonna take tackle them one by one. In the box, that was mentioned in the application where we can include letter of intent changes. Would we put this issue there? Yes, that is where you document what changes you want to make to your letter of intent. Would this result in splitting your letter of intent into multiple? No, if you only submitted one, regardless of number of sites identified on there, if you only submitted one, you will not end up with you know five more, for example. So you'll only you'll still only have the one. You'll have the amount of number that you submit. It's just information for us to be able to capture as well and acknowledge. If you submitted a letter of intent stating we had two sites, is it possible to change that to three sites now? And that has been answered as well in this webinar, and that is no. You cannot increase the number of sites based off what you already submitted with your letter of intent. Did you say we could modify the letter of intent if we wanted to add a site? Again, that's no, if you submitted one letter of intent with five sites identified or 10 letter of intents with one site each, that is the maximum number of applications you can submit. Some technical difficulties, so please, again, if you're having difficulties with the application, please email us so we can support you. And I've also let our 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 team know who oversees that system um, that there are some issues, but please reach out to us for support as well. We can provide one on one support. Will a video recording of this training be available on the CDA website? Yes, that will get posted. When will the letter of intent be approved? Also, when will it be available to make fixes or adjustments to the letter of intent? You will not receive any approval of your letter of intent. You, um, if you submitted one, you will now go into submitting your application. And you will document within your application what changes need to be made and our team will support you if you need to make adjustments to your letter. Will our after school program qualify for the 18 to 22 year old participants? Um, I can answer that. I will actually say that question is unclear. I don't know the relevance to this request for application opportunity. Um, so if you could provide more clarity around that. Um, again, I believe if you were to review the request for application, it will provide the, the parameters and the intent of this grant funding opportunity. So I'm not really sure how this question is applicable. Thanks, Chantel. I submitted one letter of intent for two separate companies. Each has its own tax ID. I don't know if that's a question or just a, a statement, but I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to respond to there, Chantel. 
It sounds to me like this is an individual that submitted one letter of intent and they identified two separate locations or I'm not clear if it's location or entity. If, the, if it's location, then yes, we would identify this as two separate sites, which equals two separate locations. And the applicant would be eligible to apply for funding for each individual application up to the maximum dollar amount. I hope that provides clarification around the ask. It's not very clear what the ask is here. I submitted one letter of intent with four sites, but it only had a space for one facility license number. Do I need to revise and submit four letters of intent? No, you don't. When you start to submit your applications, you'll do one application for each site. And within your application, we are asking the question of what was the primary entity name on your letter of intent and the applic application ID from your letter of intent so that we can verify that you submitted your letter of intent and your application will capture the license ID for each site. So again, you'll need to submit four applications. Okay. There was a continuation from the, I submitted one letter of intent for two separate companies with one company has two ADCs and one has one ADC. Should I clarify that in the letter of intent changes section? I received one application number for all three ADCs. I want to be clear that you identified, if you identify two, it sounds like you're only eligible to apply for two locations. So even though it was intended for three, without that being clear that it was for three different site locations, not necessarily the, diff the lines of business at two different sites, Please, we're, we're funding this by location. So unless you provided clarity with your LOI that you were applying for two different locations, then it's going to be allow you to apply for funding for two. If you provided clarity that although you're applying for funding for two lines of business, three different sites, then um, is, if you have three sites in there, then you'll be eligible to apply for funding for all three. But you may need to require some technical assistance um, and following up um, with the email at CDA Bridge Recovery or for any of these um, options that are currently on the screen, just to make sure that we have an understanding of what it is that you actually did and the intent. Unfortunately, we won't be able to update the number of sites if it's not, if it wasn't initially made clear in the original LOI submission. Do we have to name the actual staff person for each person we would like to give a raise to? If so, it looks like the limit of staff to give a raise or bonus or hire as temporary persons limited to 10 people. We would like to give raises to our drivers, program aides, social workers, RN. We have many more than 10. There is a requirement for you to ensure that your raises are comparable. So you're going to have to provide some details and some additional documentation around um, the request. So um, it sounds to me like your budget's going to break this out based upon each individual person you're providing information to. But as far as naming the individual, you're going to likely have to name the position and provide the comparables as to how you identify that this raise is within the guidelines of whatever the wage uh, rate is within that particular area where you're providing services. And I, I'll say to the CDA team and all of you, I think we can add more lines to that within the application portal if that's something that um, CDA agrees should be added as well. So I think we can put more lines for people to add. That'll be fine. OK, one other question. So program directors, case managers and direct care workers are eligible for bonuses. Uh, I made it clear that program director, anybody that is considered executive leadership other than a program director is not eligible for the bonuses. What will be the impact on the overall funding if some applicants are funded at reduced amounts or not funded at all?
any funding that's left over from this round, will we will CDA will partner with PCG to um, release a second round of funding. So there will be another grant funding opportunity. Who determines that we are in good standing? How do we how do we prove we are in good standing? Good standing is applicable to your license status with whatever entity you're licensed by. If you're an adult day health care center, that licensing status will be verified with the California Department of Public Health. If you're a pay site, then that will be validated by the Department of Health Care Services. And if you are an adult day program, that licensing status will be validated by the Department of Social Services. Additionally, how do we know what temporary staff we will need in October when we're submitting the application in July? Will we be able to clarify, clarify our needs more when we are making the request for reimbursement for funding? The thought behind this is that you're going to be projecting what your needs are based upon your center status. And, and yes, you will have an opportunity to clarify your needs because since this is being done on a reimbursement basis, there's going to be a need for you to submit invoices, to submit additional documentation, um, just to validate whatever your staffing needs are in association with whatever wage rate you're paying them. So there will be an opportunity to provide the additional documentation. Um, when you are requesting reimbursement um, for whatever those salary and wages are for that temporary staff. To confirm, if we did one letter of intent for multiple sites, we can use that one letter of intent code for multiple applications. Yes, that is correct. Our team, as we start to review, will be able to look at that letter of intent and make sure that you identify that, that exact number of sites. Just to make sure I'm following, for a letter of intent that included multiple license sites, there should be an application submitted for each of the license sites, correct? Yes. Do we need to apply for funding first before we implement the program? Yes. So we will be going through the uh, review of the application in order to determine who meets the criteria to be awarded funding. So it is in the best interest of yourself to make sure that you don't position yourself to assume that you're going to be awarded. Um, so and we are only doing uh, providing the awards on a reimbursement basis. So yes, you must apply for funding. You must be reviewed and scored. And uh, based upon that, once we have um, implemented contracts, we will be able to, um, you will be able to be secure in being able to move forward with whatever projects you have identified in your grant application. Two questions. How long and short is it to answer the questions? At most 300 words or less. I would have to look at the application for each one. Each question has its own um, multiple words, but those are all within the application. So for each question where you have narrative, it can tell you. I believe for most of them, the max was 250, um, which is a fair amount of thing, but um, some of them are less depending on the type of question. That second question, one site showed in the portal while the other facility is not. Who do we need to communicate with regarding this technical problem? If you submitted two letters of intent and you're only seeing one, please reach out to that email CDA underscore bridge to recovery at PCGUS.com and we can look within the system to see if there's a second one. You also should have received a confirmation email for each letter that you submit or submitted. Excuse me. But please feel free to email us and we can help you. I have a successful application ID, says awaiting review status. How can I get my application approved now so I can submit? You will not receive any approval of your letters of intent. 
you just had to submit it, please submit your application. When our team is conducting their review, they will look at your application, which is asking for a lot of information, but including the primary entity name on your letter of intent and that application ID so that we can verify on our end that you did in fact submit a letter of intent and the information within there. So you don't need to, bring, to get any approval of your letter of intent. How many letters of intent did you receive? When you say that this is a competitive grant, does that mean that some people won't be getting the grant based on the application submitted? What is the plan for any remaining financials that aren't distributed? Might there be a second round? Yes, and I believe we did answer that question previously. Yep. So any um, funds that are left on the table, CDA will partner with PCG to release a second round of funding, another opportunity for funding. And there were, within the letters of intent received, 555 sites identified within those letters. What documentation will be required during the application process? Will documented project bids, et cetera, et cetera be required at this stage? Yes, there will be at least um, some documentation required is in, it is documented within the application with examples. If you are doing something like a vehicle modification or air filtration or something that requires a contractor or a vendor, um, we are requiring that you submit one bid with your application. Can you ask for funds to hire staff and install a filtration system, or can you only pick one project? You can pick is any of them. So if you've got only one thing that you want to focus on, you can do that. If there are four things within the approved list that you want to submit an application for, you can do that. But the maximum funding amount remains the same per application. We have an application ID and letter of intent submission, confirmation, grant connect, grants connect site says awaiting review and will not allow access to an application. Again, please make sure you're using the actual link for the application, not using the letter of intent link that was sent at the beginning of May. The program web page at CDA's website has the application link. It's been added to the chat. We can add it again as well. Please make sure you're using that. If that doesn't work automatically, please clear your browser history, your cookies, your cache. Try another browser. If that still doesn't work, please email, it up, email us and we can support you. Okay, so here's a question about funding in the budget area, Chantel. What about for the staff who have to manage all of the documentation for reimbursement each month, work on management of the of the projects under this grant? Is there an administrative amount that is allowable? I have to take that back. I don't recall um, where this would be captured, but I do believe there are certain costs, indirect costs that would be captured within your budget. But I'm I not believe so as well, but I'd have to, yeah, I'd want to look at yeah. that as well. But we'll make sure that that question is answered in the RFA addendum. Will there be additional allocation once all applications are processed? I believe Chantal's answered that as well. It that maybe it depends on how much funding actually gets dispersed with this first round. Is that correct? That is correct, Brittany. I submitted a letter of intent but did not get an email on May 16th. What entity would that email be from? It's it's an interesting name. Um, it is, I don't know, Peter, if you know off the top of your head. I'm sorry, Brittany. <laughs> the email name or address that the um the confirmation email from Grants Connect. Yes. Yes, it should come from your cause LLC, I believe. Thank you. It's uh if it's not if I'm incorrect and I'm pretty sure I'm right, it's also definitely listed in the Grants Connect guide. So you can find it there on the CDA webpage. 
Perfect. Thank you. Make sure that you also check your spam or junk folders. If you use Microsoft Outlook, there's a focused or other inbox that sometimes shows up. Please make sure you check all of those as well. But if you don't find it, please email us and we can look in the system. We have two pay sites or locations. One does not require a license. Can we apply for funding for the site that does not have its own license number? So is the question whether or not they are eligible to compete for this funding without having a license. It is a requirement that you are licensed. Um, and it's our understanding that that would be at the pay site that would be done by the Department of Health Care Services. So that to me, um, if because upon further review, when we get to that application, it may be um, determined that it is not an eligible application because it does, meet, does not meet the licensing requirement. If our letter of intent is still showing a waiting review, but we received a link with an application, is there anything else we need to do? Not with your letter of intent. You can just go ahead and submit your application. I don't need to add any sites. They were included in my original letter of intent. However, if I need to include a different number for each site on the application, then I need, need to know how to update the letter of intent for each site. You'll have the questions within the application about updating your letter of intent. And for each application site, there's the, um, the field to enter your site number, your license number. For the wage differential project, can we estimate how many more employees we will hire in 2024 and 2020, 20, 2025 to calculate the wage differential that we want to add to those people's base wages. We expect and home to grow in 2024 and 2025. Can you repeat that, Brittany? I'm trying to catch up in the chat. Like, I've gotten yeah. Here. For the wage differential project, can we estimate how many more employees we will hire in 2024 and 2025 to calculate the wage differential that we want to add to those people's base wages. We expect it sounds like to grow within the next few years. I would say yes, because your budget can be broken down by the year. So based upon your projections and your calculations, we would not anticipate that you would even begin submitting any invoices or documentation until around that time. And since it's done on a reimbursement basis, as long as all that comports to the funding amount feeling that you're being awarded, then there would be no problem for you to um, project what that wage differential cost would be, as long as your budget clearly specifies the year and those calculations. And that doesn't have to be based on current employees for the wage differential, Chantel. It can be based off of if I'm going to hire three employees next year mm -hmm. and I want to do something with wage differentials. Yeah. Them. Okay. Perfect. So I want to make sure we hit all pieces on that. OK. No ability to add a site to what was listed on the letter of intent. I wish the email that stated that we could make changes to letter of intent once we started the application was a bit more clear. I understood it to mean that any changes we wanted to make to a letter of intent that didn't comply to updated regulations would be able to be modified during the application. Might this possibility become available should some applications not make it past the first step for eligibility? And I did want to clarify, I believe the email clarification we sent out did provide options and it provided some clarification that uh, you basically can apply for site. You know, we talked about tax ID number, um, that type of thing. But really, in essence, it's about applying for site. So if you submitted your LOI and you specified that you were applying for funding for three sites before we even sent out any clarification, then we counted three sites in um, the fact that you were going to potentially apply for up to three sites or, or three sites. With the clarification that was sent out, it was basically letting those who uh, providing the clarification that 
it wasn't about the tax ID number that determined how many sites you could apply for. We were more or less removing that parameter and basically saying that you can apply for whatever number of sites you needed to, regardless of tax ID number and association there. Uh, apologies if there was any misunderstanding, but we felt like the additional clarification was clear that it wasn't tied to a tax ID and that you have the ability before the close of the LOI to make that update and also to reach out and get the technical assistance that you may have needed in order to meet that required deadline. Thank you, Chantel. If I submitted one letter of intent and listed multiple sites, am I able to request funding for all sites that were included? Yes, you will submit an application for each site, however, and reference that initial one letter of intent. Will this webinar be recorded or will this webinar recording be available publicly? It will be on the CDA webpage. And I don't think there's any special access there. I submitted one letter of intent and said two sites when it asked how many sites. I should be able to do two applications, correct? One for each site I put on the one letter of intent. That is correct. If infection prevention project was done a year ago, can we add those to the grant? No, we are not allowing any prior projects to be um, reimbursed with this funding. These are for prospective going projects going forward. Um, and again, as mentioned, um, it's in your best interest to not make the assumption of award and to hold off until you have been confirmed for an award. Otherwise, you may not be subject to getting that project reimbursed. Will additional funds be dispersed at a later time if not all applications are funded? And that has been answered as well. And the answer is yes, there would be around two if there are fund funds remaining from this first round. We answered that. What do you mean by partial funding? Um, so we want to clarify here, there are eligible and ineligible expenses, obviously. So we are going to review each request. If, for instance, in that full application review, we identify that some of the requests do meet the parameters and others do not, then we will look at the budget to determine how much of that meets the requirements for the eligible component and that which do not will not be funded. So that constitutes there being a potential for partial funding. Thank you. We want to address wage differentials on the salaries and wages tab of the application. It only allows us to address up to 10 staff members. We have 14 direct care staff we want to include in the grant. Yes, we will work with our team to add additional lines to that. Um, I believe somebody else had that same question. And so um, we will make that update and uh, it'll be in there. I have to work with our team, but I would assume within the next few days, you'll see that update. Is fire sprinkler system falling into the modifying usable space to promote safety? We take this one into consideration, I believe, from the stance of making sure that it provides a health and a safe environment for participants. Um, we'll have to consider this one with further discussion on this one. So I don't want to provide an answer today on that. OK, that will be included in the addendum for the RFA. We didn't receive an email following our letter of intent and do not have a letter of intent application number. How can we submit a full application? You can email us, number one, to verify that your letter of intent was submitted if you would like and that it's in the system. But to submit your application, you just have to access the application link. Um, please check your emails as well to see if you received the confirmation email. And again, you can email us and we can see if it's in the system so we can supply that to you to include with your application. But they are two separate links for submission. Besides receiving an email from Grants Connect support team stating you have su successfully submitted your application and provides the application ID number, do we get any other email from CDA stating our letter of intent is accepted? There will be no additional emails regarding your letter of intent. 
So you will not get anything that it's been accepted or approved or rejected or denied or anything like that. If you have questions whether there is one in the system and you cannot find your email or application ID, you can email us and we can look in the system, but you will not get anything else about your letter of intent. We are doing a renovation to install sprinklers. However, if it involves improving ventilation systems to meet recommended CDC standards, can we supplement funds received from the sprinklers for the CDC if work has not started? We identified the site in the letter of intent. I'm unclear here if you all received funding for this from another entity. Um, when you said supplement, it makes me think that there was funding that was provided towards the renovation to install the sprinklers. So a little bit more information is needed around this. And also we would like the prior question, and I'm assuming you're talking about fire sprinklers, um, and that's not clear either. But if so, this goes back to the prior question with where we want to do some internal discussions to see if that meets the criteria for with grant funding of uh, creating a ventilated space. Thank you. So more to come. OK, every year we allocate funds for all of our eligible employees retirement funds, and that is helpful to maintain the workforce. However, this year we cannot afford the contribution due to running a deficit. Can we use the BTR grant for this activity? Can you go, Peter, can you go back to slide 12? I want to just double check what we said again regarding staffing. It may be the prior one as well. I think you were on the, the right one, slide 12. Thank you. I'm not sure if the criteria falls under temporary workers, wage differential. So um, all dependent on if this can fall into staff retention bonuses, et cetera. Those are things that you all would have to provide the justification around this ask, um, and that will give us an opportunity to review it to determine whether or not it's something that is eligible. But I, we will take this question back as well for consideration. Um, I don't have a, a clear response today. Is there another way to download the application questions than through the portal? That is the only place where they are, but if um, if there's a question or concern, please email us and we can try to support you. Since we are hoping to get more funding in stage two, should we include the additional project with the current application? Since you're hoping to get more funding in stage two, so that's in anticipation of there being a second round. Should you include the additional project with the current application? Um, my recommendation is that based upon the existing award amount, uh, your budget should comport to what the ceiling is for this funding. Um, there's no guarantee of a round two. And there's no guarantee of getting the full amount of funding, all depending upon the review. Um, I would just say that it's in your best interest to provide the best application you can for whatever your needs are and provide the required documentation and justification for that, as there is no guarantee that there will be a funding left over for a round two. What if rent, oh, sorry, do we have to pay taxes on the grant funding? I believe that's a question that's not best to be answered by CDA. That's something that you may want to provide uh, to whoever provides oversees your operations and your fiscal component. I don't have an answer for that. What if renovations were already done during COVID? Can we use those expenses during this grant? No, we are not funding any prior projects with this funding. These are only for projects that are um, going forward after there has been an award made. I apologize if this was already stated. I submitted a separate letter of intent for each site. 
When it asked if you operate multiple facilities and how many you intend to request funding for, on each LOI, I listed all of my sites. Do I need to change the LOI in the application or will it matter since each site had a separate LOI anyway? You won't need to change anything. We took that into account when we were reviewing all the letters of intent. So um, you'll do one application for each letter of intent. I think the five or however many you said. Can we build a sewer line system under the sanitation and infection control category? That's something that we would have to research. These may be questions and depending on building code, et cetera, and what's allowable by the city, et cetera. Um, then I, I, that's not a question I can answer right here, um, but provide the justification. And that's something we will address in the RFA addendum. And I did want to point out that we are already at time. And it's unfortunate we're not able to get to every one of these questions, but we do have the chat. We'll be able to look through these remaining questions and we will provide answers in the request for um, application addendum. Um, I do want to again, want to take the time to remind everybody about the grant assistance options that are provided here on the screen. Thank you again for your interest in this grant funding opportunity. Um, and we're hopeful that the resources that are provided on the grant um, opportunities webpage will be helpful. Um, and we hope that the RFA addendum questions will also be helpful in completing your submitted application. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today.